So I bought a really expensive guitar. How expensive? Like, like I'm trying to think of what is comparable in terms of expense. Um, more than a computer. Um, let's see. Yeah, I know, right? Um, what is less than a car. Less than a car for a year in New York. <laughs> I don't even know what that costs. I don't know what it costs either, but it's something ungodly. <laughs> Less than ten thousand and, and more than four. Ooh, yeah, it's a great. Well, does it sound good? It sounds fantastic. It sounds <laughs> guitars, fantastic. Guitars should cost that much. Is it brand new? And, it is. Yeah, uh, it's not a not an antique. Professional it, guitars should cost that much. I agree. Uh, we, they, they, and not only should they cost that much, but if you haven't totally done something stupid to them, they might depreciate a little because, you know, you've got to deal with them unless you have a private sale, someone's going to take a cut. But it's basically to hold on to a $6,000 guitar for seven years and maybe sell it in seven years. You're either going to come out way ahead or you're going to lose a month's rent. So the person you're listening to is David Partikian, who is our guest on Funny Not Funny, the podcast today. It is Monday, April 11th, and I'm here with Lionel and David. Um, and I want to uh, introduce you, David. So here's what I know, because I've known you a very long time, but what the stuff that I've known, I know the least amount about is your 30 years uh, on U.S. flagged vessels, which you'll have to explain why. I don't say merchant marines, um, but basically you have been at sea and uh, on a number of different vessels, and you said you spent a cumulative amount of seven years actually on the water, both licensed and unlicensed. For the longest time, you were unlicensed, is what I understand, and then you became licensed and your second mate, if I'm, if I'm correct. Uh, and I'm we're going to talk mate, about... Yeah. Yeah. We're going to talk about... Big ships, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Big that's, ships. The bigger, the better. Well, that's good. Uh, and the first thing is saying uh, merchant marine or U.S. flag vessels, yeah, yeah. which becomes, uh, we don't have much of a merchant marine anymore. And uh, the merchant marine worldwide is the first industry to get hit with globalization. It got hit very early in the 50s and 60s. So, you have countries like Moldova, Liberia, the Maldive Islands. Any place can put together a flag and, and the flags of the world or the vessels of the world can get their ships certified there. The Seychelles are a big one now. Mm -hmm. And it, it limits the liability for an accident and allows people to avoid first world wages and everything. So when we have a, a U.S. flag, there's a certain amount of subsidies in Congress uh, to make sure that we have enough sailors to um, respond to a national emergency. And it, occasionally when you have them, you get <clears throat> like, uh, what was the hurricane for that wiped out Puerto Rico? Uh, I don't remember the name of the hurricane that wiped out Puerto Rico, but I remember many. it. Yeah, okay. Uh, you know, and then they say they can't get the goods to Puerto Rico because of the Jones Act, which is basically if there's no Jones Act, we don't work anymore. In the, in the Merchant Marine. And, um, you know, and I try to explain to people, it's like, no, this is not an unfair law. This is look up cabotage in the dictionary. You don't have Lufthansa flying a flight between Minneapolis and St. Louis and competing with United Airlines and American Airlines to do that. But what basically what you're saying is you would allow a Chinese vessel to undercut U.S. prices and transport something from Boston to Virginia and also undercut the highway system. So that it's a very firm law that most people don't understand. And when it does get any sort of publicity, it comes out to be anti, uh, anti industry. So the Jones <clears throat> act is, is for shipping between where the source and the destination are both the United States. Any ship, any country, any ship in the world, any flag vessel can take a ship from one port to another, from one country to another. Uh, so you could take a ship from uh, Shanghai to San Francisco. You're not allowed to take cargo from Shanghai to Hawaii, pick up cargo in Hawaii and offload it in San Francisco. The cargo between Hawaii and San Francisco is reserved for a U.S. ship. Consequently, you can't come from China and 
take off almost all of your cargo in LA and decide that you're just going to fly the coast and drop off goods in Alaska. That's what you can't do. That's undercutting U.S. truckers. It's undercutting right. U.S. Men. It's undercutting our ability to move logistically move products from A to B. And uh, you know, uh, the Republicans. Nobody's really against it. It's an issue that they the fringes can somehow get around. Like, God damn, these people are ripping off Americans. But it's like you, you explain it with the airlines. It's like, are you gonna? I mean, nobody likes the airlines. Nobody likes flying any of them <laughs> these days. But are you really going to say you want Lufthansa competing on a Minneapolis to St. Louis route? And yeah, right. But so, just make sure I understand the Jones Act. So it's it's shipping that if if goods are being transported from one American port to another American port, they have to be in American flagged vessels. Yes. And okay. the, uh, the only, and the only, and so anybody can bring ports from any in the world in and any right. country in the world can transport it out. You just can't fly trade along the coast. Or, right. or, and that's completely reasonable. And people look at it as not reasonable. And you get these Hoover th think tanks saying that, oh, this is what's destroying Puerto Rico in the last earthquake. It's no, it was destroying Puerto, not the last earthquake, the um, hurricane. Uh, the hurricane. Uh, what was destroying them was that our infrastructure is based on um, containers, and containers have a deep draft. And there's only like there's Boston, Port Elizabeth, New Jersey, Norfolk, Virginia, Jacksonville, Florida on the East Coast. It's very limited, and these are huge terminals set to do this. And when you have a disaster on a small island like um, like Puerto Rico, you can't. You know, if the if the main container terminal was destroyed, which it was, <laughs> then then it's like, well, yeah, it's you've hard. got to pull a whole bunch of ships out of here or there who have to be able to transfer to a barge and get it into a back road that's been destroyed. The total infrastructure is gone, and nobody wanted to address that. They just wanted to make bogeymen out of it. I think the other thing, too, about the Jones Act, well, I think you sort of touched on why it's really important, is that... Um, a merchant marine, whatever you want to call it, of of of, of capability for for handling cargo, uh, maritime traffic, is a national defense asset. You gotta. It's why yeah, so we, so we support a bunch thing. of industries that otherwise wouldn't exist because of because if there is a war or there's some kind of thing, we got to be able to do that ourselves. Absolutely, and and for that reason, I've been kind of on a gov government subsidy <laughs> a lot of my working life where we have ships and, and, you know, I was on ships that would go from the, from Port Elizabeth, New Jersey to a couple of ports in the Mediterranean to Dubai, to Saudi Arabia, to Singapore. And we were carrying a lot of just domestic cargo between the two. We get anything, but we also were receiving a subsidy, which paid the entire crew of the vessel for the entire year for each company to be reserving a certain amount of space for military cargo that might have to be moved in a time of emergency and everything. Yep. And it enabled us to get a first world wage, not a great wage. But, you know, I, I yeah. sell what, uh, what, what I make as a what I've made an unlicensed is equivalent to what a lot of um third world or a developing nation mariners make, which is all of them if it's a flag of convenience for their captain, their top employee. Well, so, so there is a relationship between the merchant Marines and the Navy, the military. Um, and is it, is it that you're, on, well, I will subcontract on ships that carry a military cargo and we'll have like 20 people on board and the Navy has about 300. Uh, and we will sit on those ships around the world. They're very, <coughs> to be fair, I'm very anti-military, not anti-military, but I grew up in a, in a family where I didn't really want to be involved in the military that much. And mm -hmm. a lot of people don't want to work on military ships. And <laughs> the more I did the industry, it's like, well, there's <clears throat> potential clash with um, the people they're more conservative than I am, and they're really into a certain philosophy of America best, America first, never question America. But these ships are very easy to work on. 
because we're waiting for a national emergency. So we're not going from A to B. We're not on some crazy schedule. We have cargo that we never hope to have to deliver for any reason. And these can be some of the most fun four months I have because, you know, it's a lot less pressure. It's all, it's all, you know, red tape and bullshit basically, right. but you hope you're not going anywhere and you're at a port in an exotic location somewhere that, oh, uh, anywhere from you're already in Korea to you could be in Korea in six days <laughs> or right. Taiwan in six days. So you're, you're with access to an exotic island somewhere and you're just, in my case, eating sushi five days a week and writing in my overtime and it's like, wow, I don't have, have to deal about traffic. I don't have to deal about the cargo coming off and on and, and make sure that all 180 reefers are plugged in correctly. That's another thing. Um, oh, if you look at container ships, the big money is all the refrigerated cargo. And, uh, and uh. oh, my God, the refrigerated cargo is huge. So anybody who makes a mistake with refrigerated cargo is fine. You know. and uh, there are two let's, or three let's get something out of the way. Hold a second. Let's get something out of the way right now. Were you the guy who like stuck that ship in the in the Suez Canal? I just want to get that out of the way well, right now. I promise that <laughs> we would not talk. I was about waiting it. forever yeah, for I, a part for my I heater. Have, I have photos of the ship behind it because that is my union. The ship right behind it in the traffic jam was the Maersk, Ohio, and so we won't talk about the incident directly. But uh, Captain Kavanaugh. <laughs> Uh, when you talk about working up in an industry, like in any industry, if you have family in the industry, it's easier. Say so he had a brother who was a pilot in uh, for Charleston Harbor. And he was just a kid like me, about my age. And he, he went off. He was living abroad and uh, became a pastry chef in Australia. His visa got called up in the relationship he was in. He flew back and he was sailing ordinary seamen. With me, and we kind of stayed in touch with emails every few years, and lo and behold, he's the captain of the Merced, Ohio, the top job in the industry, and he's stuck right behind. <laughs> oh, man. Did he land the right. horn? <laughs> Get it out of here. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Get your freaking shit out of here. Um, but, but technically, legally, the ever given was supposed to be on the horn every two minutes. There's an, a ground, uh, there's a sound signal for being a ground. And guarantee it was driving anybody nuts who had to be within a two mile radius because every oh, two minutes. And, you know, it, this is shameful because I've got the maritime thing here, but nobody in my, my license is going to expire because I haven't sailed since COVID. But this book, Navigational Rules, the Rules of the Road, you have to have it memorized to be out there. And if you make a mistake, if I just said to a captain on the bridge, I didn't recognize what the vessel of ground signal is. I mean, mm -hmm. I know what I know what underway is. That's two, that's two blasts every two minutes. That's one blast every two minutes. Then there's two blasts every two minutes means you're you're technically you don't have the anchor down, so you're drifting. And then there's a long and a short or something, which would be a vessel aground. The ever driven the ever driven was supposed to be ringing that, and that must have just sucked because those things are loud. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we got and that these, out of the way. I mean, for anybody who's not, I don't know, we all get to follow the big ships when they end up going awry. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, we do. <laughs> and then you, David, everybody's an expert. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Suddenly we all know. But, you know, you know, these are, it's hard to get your head around exactly how huge they are um, and how much they hold. Oh, okay. and, um, and, and the physics involved. You were saying earlier today, we were talking before we did this podcast, and you were saying... You're talking about one of the problems with the Titanic, which I found fascinating. Did you want to, do you remember what you were saying? Well, um, that, that's the same with the Ever Given, the Titanic. I was one of these kids who was a Titanic freak. And ironically, it's not on the bookshelf now. I've been through most of the books and the movie killed it for me, the last one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, was a, it was a very good movie. Uh, I still prefer the original Night to Remember, the uh, British one. Uh, but... The Titanic and its sister ship, the Olympia, were so big when they were built at Allen Wolf Shipwork Yards that there were immediate problems when they came out. They would be in a harbor, and their draft was such that smaller vessels were pulled towards them, and it would they'd pop their lines at the pier like they were rubber bands. And the Titanic got into a collision coming out of Queensboro, you know, which... <laughs> 
is it a collision with a vessel that was moored and all its mooring lines parted because of the laws of physics and you were next to it? They weren't prepared for how big those ships were. Uh, that well, I mean, I'd have to go back. I'm now I'm speaking without any expertise. I mean, I know to that degree, but I don't know how many problems it was going to cause. The fact that Titanic sank, and I believe the Olympia ended up being torpedoed. So ships of that era, because of World War One and everything, didn't have a. They they, they usually weren't mothball. Something happened to them. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, the ships are so big now. And to give you an idea, just as a third mate. Third mate, mind-numbing, overtime work that's about $50 an hour would be after you leave a port, climbing between all the cargo bays and looking up, and there's going to be a tare, there's going to be an identification number on every single container, and you're matching it with the cargo manifest, triple-checking to make sure no mistakes were made, and... That is probably about 15, 20 hours. Wow. You know, it's gonna take it's gonna take two days leaving port. You put in your four, you put in your four, you put in your four, and if there's anything glaring, you let them know or you don't see something last, right? Um, that's not something that's done instantaneously or, <laughs> and that that's how big it is. There could be you know, there could be 18 cargo bays. How do you, I mean, container. how high are these? I mean, how high do they stack them on the, on the deck? Oh, they, the super stacking, God, I'm going to, I'm going to say they can go about eight high now. And that's wow. above the deck. They can go about 10, 10 high below the deck. Wow. You know, that's so, Whoa. you know, and, and it, the, the, the hint is if you see a ship uh, sailing in to, to Boston or something, how low in the water is it? If it's low in the water, it's carrying a lot of containers you can't see. Right. Now. I mean, I lived right on the pier or right in Puget Sound in Seattle for 30 years. So, <clears throat> you know, you know, there's a trade deficit because ships are always sailing to China light. <laughs> they're coming back heavy. <laughs> they're riding high. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're riding. They're, they're, we're sending a lot of empties back. And we always have been. That goes back pre-COVID. The fact that we couldn't get all those empties back and they didn't have the empties to fill and everything to me that adds to our logistical nightmare what they're trying to, you know, blame whatever administrations happens to be in. It's the right. Democrats now it's hard to. What, um, so, but you were saying you're going to be, you climbed between the stacks. Is there scaffolding or something? How do you get No, up? there's, there's going to be, um, there's going to be in a thwart ships, um, passageway. And it's, it's, it's this nasty little the steel that, or, or metal that you use a shaw saw to cut if you have to fit it in place. And, um, but you're going to have up to two stack, up to two containers. You're going to have a certain type of uh, lashing gear that holds it down. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, they're going to be twist locks. So it's putting in Lego. And the twist locks can go like another six, seven, eight higher to a manifold. And, and, you know, when they're that high, if you see them stacked that high, there's a, they're called cell guides so that, that the crane operators drop them in a cell guide. So they really can't go left or right and everything. They're in there. Mm -hmm. And only if they're above the cell guide do they need something extra put in. But this is, this is all the stuff that nobody cares about unless it goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but if it goes question, wrong, you just get a, you get, you get a letter, you're fired. So let's, <laughs> let's say we got, we got eight containers stacked above the deck. Mm -hmm. I can't believe we're having this conference. This is great. We, we're, we're venturing into com completely yeah. new territory here. Let's you're say gonna eight. Eight. you're going to have eight. Yeah, Let's say could. we got eight. And I need to read the code off of the second from the top, number six or number seven. How do I get up to number seven to read that code? Well, the, the first thing I do is try to read it from the bridge while I'm on watch with binoculars. <laughs> as a problem area that I don't want to climb up to. And if I could see a whole row with binoculars, I'm going to cross that out on my manifest. And cause I don't want to go climbing around any more than I have to. And less so as I get older, when I was younger, it'd be like, Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm going but to if do you're climbing around, are there like ladders? Yeah. There's oh, okay. ladder ones on each side, but you know, I'm six foot two. They're not really made for six foot two person. Let's put it this way. A modern merchant Marine vessel is made for a Filipino or developing nation sailor. Mm -hmm. So some of these passageways are like five, six, <laughs> right. and they're steel and steel is very unforgiving. So if I don't have to crawl up, you know, 
six, six, uh, four ladder wells to get to the top, with a ladder well having two containers, top and bottom. I would prefer to not do that, but yeah, yeah you're going to have to get to it most of the time. Most of the time, you have to crawl up and do it. But some of the top ones are, well, how can I read this? And, and then in the end, there's just like, I couldn't read it, and you just lie. And hopefully, that's not a lost container. Get fired. <laughs> what? So what? Um, uh, it just sounds like it sounds like incredibly dangerous work. You're out on the sea; things are moving around. Wait, does this happen in the port, or does it happen when you're underway? Oh, we do that underway. But I, yeah. <laughs> I'm also usually because I don't like sailing. As I've gotten older, I, you know, there's guys. If I told people, if you told people that, oh, I'm in the industry and I have seven years sea time after 30 years, you know, look at what what the fuck was he doing? You know, this guy's not. Yeah, you know, is he even vested? Yeah, I'm barely vested. I'm vested in my license unions for a pension of like two hundred dollars a year at age 65. Whereas. If I sailed five or six months a year for 20 years, which is their traditional deal, I'd be getting a lot more. But, you know, one of the things that I had once I got my license is when a ship gets into a U.S. ship gets into a U.S. harbor outside of the hours of eight and four, Monday to Friday, you need a replacement mate so that those guys can go home and see their families or those those people. We've got a lot of female mates nowadays. Um mm -hmm. So those those jobs then go to somebody maybe looking to ship kind of, except it's a it's a five, six hundred dollar shift for an eight hundred for 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 an eight hour work. But it, it's very responsible because you know we you have to make sure you have to have the reefer count done correctly, the reefer containers. And uh, and that gets you fired. I mean, if you if one of those reefer containers isn't plugged in right or the temperature's wrong, all of a sudden, you're talking about like Safeway doesn't have chicken in Oahu for two weeks. Wow. And you're not replacing it. That's why there's like a $10 million claim on it. And that's why everybody's fired if something happens to that container. If it's just something that's not uh, climate controlled because a, a refrigerated container could be carrying tropical plants. It just controls right. the temperature between two very specific set points. Um or it's got a set point, but it can only deviate by a certain amount. And God, you know, most of the really uptight, bad behavior and firings for no reason that I've seen on ships have to deal with reefers. <laughs> wow. So it, it just comes up. It's just the economics of it are different. Um, that's where the money is. So you, so you, all right. So you have this incredibly heavy ship uh, going across the Atlantic or the Pacific. Um, did you ever kind of get into weather where it felt like the ship was small compared to what was happening around you or does it pretty much cut through everything? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, I've had friends who've been on ships where the general alarm was sounded. The general alarm being, you know, that's an imminent problem that has to be dealt with. Otherwise you go from general alarm to abandoned ship. There are two alarms. Wow. And this is something like with uh, in a, I don't sail on cruise ships, but to me, like something like the coast of Concordia is, well, did they sound the general alarm or did they keep it all silent before they had an abandoned ship? But they, they're two very, very specific and different sounds. And you're going to make any effort to save a vessel. But I, I know friends who have been on ships where the general alarm has been sounded. And that's anything from a laundry room fire to a serious incident. We did lose a ship a couple of years ago. It was not my union, but the industry is small enough that I, I know good friends with someone who sailed with the captain who's responsible for that. Um, there is that book. Huh. David's There's looking through his, his book of, uh, of maritime incidents right here. <laughs> in the shelf. His library of yeah. seaborne yeah. disasters. <laughs> You know what? I think I took it off because I didn't. I didn't think it made my A shelf. <laughs> <laughs> this is the A shelf. This is the A shelf. But it, oh, here it is. I, I do have it. Rachel's played into the raging sea. Ah. Uh. That is. Um, that is the. Um, she actually did a very good account for a non-sailor or someone not in industry. She's the business writer of the El Faro, which is the ship that went down during uh, Hurricane Joaquin. 
uh, about five or six years ago now, a loss right. of everybody involved. Uh, uh, that's the first loss of a U.S. maritime vessel. Uh, U.S. merchant fleet, fishing boats go down all the time. <laughs> right. Fishing is a different animal. And pleasure boats go down. But as far as a major shipping company losing a vessel outright, doesn't happen that often to us. It does happen around the world. I mean, I'm on <laughs> sites where it comes in, but have I ever felt nervous? Yeah, of course I felt nervous. <laughs> um, uh, have I ever had the general alarm rung? No, I've never even seen a fire. I've done weekly fire drills. And the one they always warn us about is the laundry room. You know, so it's it's funny living with um <laughs> without with Allison now, and you know, she's walking me through her house with, with very few house rules, but she shows me the like lint filter in the dryer. It's like, remember to empty this. It's like, are you kidding? I'd be fired if I didn't. If anyone's told me not empty that, I'd be gone. It's like every there's every second drill is a laundry room fire because that's where they end up happening. And <laughs> because nobody wants to even go through the drill of an engine room fire. Because yeah, my favorite thing <laughs> is when you look at some of these ships and they've got like the huge forecastle or the huge aft castle mm -hmm. and in huge letters <laughs> across the No the smoking. <laughs> no like in letters <laughs> 20 feet high. No I, I guess, I my, I guess they really mean it. My first ship was a freighter, so I, I still know that in Indo Indonesian. Dilarang Merlikok. <laughs> no smoking. smoking. <laughs> and that's on the after house, yeah. Um, uh, that's, that's, just, that's just an international... That's the U.S. Code of Federal Regulations that I think is adapted internationally. So a ship carrying a certain grade of cargo that is explosive has to have that... Written, stenciled on the house in letters so and so big in a certain color. <laughs> yeah, none of that, nothing's by accident out there. <laughs> so, so, the, so the image that a person might have of the sailors up on on deck smoking is uh, completely inaccurate. Then, oh no, Hopefully. they smoke. They smoke. <laughs> every you want a, you want a story? I was on a um, <laughs> I was on a. This is this is kind of a long story. Well, it's a good story, but this this personifies this, and this is a true story. It's like this. It's like, what's the difference between a fairy tale and a sea story? One, mm -hmm. one begins um, once upon a time, and the other is, this ain't no shit. Um, <laughs> so this ain't no shit. So I, I joined this vessel, God, it was the early 90s, right when the Russian uh, ruble had collapsed and the, the government had fallen. And it was a ship that used to be owned by George Bush Sr., a, a dummy corporation, some Texas company owned this vessel. And he had to sell because he was now the vice president and there was now grain relief going to Russia. So we were carrying this grain over to Russia. But I joined the ship when it had come back from Russia and they said that it was it was a tanker job and they called it for ABs. And, you know, I really just wanted to work and get back to my girlfriend in Switzerland. It's like, OK, I got this. I thought it was supposed to go to St. Petersburg. So what I found out when I got on board the vessel is that they dropped off grain in Russia, and it was in all the cargo holds. Where did you board the vessel? You boarded the vessel where? I boarded the vessel in New York Harbor. New York Harbor. Okay. Um, at Lightering, they took me out on a little launch. That they didn't even go there. They were just at anchor, and they were letting some cargo off before going up the river. And... Um, <laughs> so they had grain that went to St. Petersburg. And once they got to St. Petersburg, the ruble had collapsed. So mm -hmm. everybody on the ship, top to bottom, was like shacked up, having everybody do their watches, going ashore in St. Petersburg as a conquering nation with like American dollars in their pockets. They were living with women. It was, it was just insane. The stories I heard when I got back, I, I did not partake. I didn't go. But nobody wanted the ship to to leave. So there was bribes taking place to delay the cargo. So the company got a hold of it or the U S government got a hold of it. And they finally gave like a certain deadline to do all the cargo. So when we pulled out, I wasn't on board yet. There was about six inches of grain in all the holes. Well, then they went somewhere in Scotland and they loaded uh, gasoline to come back to the States. So they had done this and they'd offloaded all the gasoline and now they had to so I didn't know what I was getting into. I joined this vessel and it's like, yeah, we got a clean tank, which I've done a couple of times. It's a, but it's, it, that is dangerous. What and, does that mean? Um, what, does it, what does it mean to clean tank? 
we have to clean it so there's no speck of the old cargo to get ready for a new cargo. It's it's worse when you're going up a grade. Like the worst thing is if you're going to take jet fuel. Anything in there before isn't as pure as the jet fuel, so it has to go. Okay, so but and, but somehow so we, there's six inches. Yeah, of- back when I started, it changed. So back when I started, we would have to drop this machine down like 10 feet, let it run for 20 minutes. It was called a butterwork machine and it would spray high pressure water off the sides of the tank all the way down. Then you'd have to send guys down and to mop everything up, push it in an area and pull up buckets one by one. Total job. Even if you went to an academy, you were helping out and just back breaking work for a day. So so I joined this vessel and I found that, you know, they had done a shitty job and there was a lot of gasoline soaked grain in the holds because they'd taken oh, this back. Oh. So not only were we going to throw it over the side because it was a military subsidy, that's a different question entirely that you're not supposed to do now. You're supposed to put it in a holding tank. But and we had because it was a military ship, we had we had it. Indian nationals working on board who are studying to be engineers, but we made them the haulers, you know, right? because <laughs> this had to be done. But so this is, gets back to the smoking question. So there's this big guy, Glenn, an able-bodied seaman, and he almost, he, he, he got into some sort of incident where he got arrested in England, but the captain bailed him out, so he was on the ship. He, they weren't getting him a cab fast enough, so he punched the dispatcher. Oh. So he was, and he was a big guy, six something, and and we had, he had gone out in New York uh, the night before, and we were just sailing out, and we were going to start the tank cleaning. And, <clears throat> and I, I found out later he drank a bottle of vodka or something. But we had one, or it was, it was two days later, and he still had bottles left that he brought on board. Yeah, but we'd gone through the process, and um, <laughs> we, uh, you know, once you've done the, the drops and the, the the butterworth machine is spun and everything's supposedly clean. You got to send guys in to wipe everything up and push it in buckets and pull it out. So just total grungy, shitty work. Yeah. And um, you got respirators and a, a bag, you know, a, a, a T-Vac suit on. And I go down there with this guy and, you know, the, the mate has to go down there first and he's got a gas free meter and it's registered like gas free and then explosive free. And we got to pass on both of them. So we're down there. And this guy, Glenn, is so hungover, he, he lights up a cigarette. Oh. And, you know, we're like, we're like, <laughs> 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 and I'm just like, what are you doing? And he's so hungover, he's like, gas free, gas free. I'm like, yeah, gas free where you're standing. What about like eight feet there where they drop down the meter? It's like, I'm going to, you know, take, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I just walk out. And he's like, what are you doing? It's like, go down and deal with that guy, you know, and that's one of my nine lives because nothing happened. Uh, not, yeah. yeah, I don't want to be incinerated. Thank yeah. you. It's like it's like wow, that you really need a cigarette. <laughs> 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 Going to light it up in a gas tank when you are cleaning tanks with oh. residue of which is vapors are worse than the actual product. Oh yeah, it'll go for like a The product is usually way too dense to actually. Wow. Anyhow, <laughs> that's, um, a, that's, a, that's a true story. That, that's an ain't no shit. His name was Glenn. The ship was the MV Rover, and it was owned by George Bush Sr., but he had to divest because he was vice president. And they were, that was the worst. I mean, they, I couldn't find a life vest, which is un, un, unheard of. It's like, where's my life vest? What? Yeah. <laughs> and then you got the Indian Nationals doing all the work and... And, you know, we, we add, I asked to have them paid according to the contract that if we use outside labor, they should get the union wage. Right. And, they, they, you know, the delegate came back to me and said, it's not going to happen. But the captain gave us all an extra eight hours overtime to not make a deal and not Ooh. make a big stink about it. Yeah, yeah. What wow. are you going to do? Wow. That's, and yeah. you, you can safely tell us all of this? <laughs> Uh-oh. It's all right. Dave's Dave's screen just froze. I think as soon as I said that, uh, Uh-oh. yeah, everything shut down. down for a second. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah. we back. thought you would hit the um, the second alarm. Um, uh, I'm drinking yeah. water, by the way. <laughs> that's which is that's that's yeah, also nice. fine. That, um, but the so first yeah, time uh, I've ever seen that. <laughs> we, <laughs> um, is that so? This was the so this was this is anyway. You're allowed to. 
talk about this? I imagine there's a yeah, ton yeah, of yeah, stuff yeah. you're not allowed to talk about. Oh, no. Um, um, I don't want to get you into that. They, no, there's, there's almost nothing. Um, the, the military contracts I did, there are certain things that, I, I mean, it's all obvious and there's no secrets, so I don't think we'd ever broach something. The Chinese know the ships are there. They're there. They're huge. They're three football fields long. We're sitting on them. They know our phones. <laughs> they know everything. There's no secrets. Can uh, you, we're technically not supposed to talk about it. Are you allowed to talk about the time you you piloted near Alaska? Am I remembering that right? I'm not going <laughs> to. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Let's uh, talk about something uh, else. That's, that's what um, I was. And, 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 and that I was, one also, real quick, I, I found out my dad had broken his uh Hip, his hip a couple of days before and B had called and it's just another example as we all deal with elder care of your brain not being where it should be <laughs> yeah 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 okay and enough said uh, about, about that, that I, I, I left I left the best I, I made a little error but, well um, speaking <laughs> all right, I don't want to get you in trouble here so uh, speaking of which um, you were saying before when you didn't finish the thought because maybe you can finish it here that we a lot of people have a a misconception of what happened with the Exxon Valdez and um, uh, it, was it something about it being pilot error? It's, I think it's what we think of it as, but I don't know if you have a different perspective on that. Uh, well, first off, a lot happened and a lot went wrong that night. Um, but most of what went wrong could be attributed to the pilot. The pilot um, had to legally be on board for a certain length of time. And the pilot chose to leave at the absolute first moment that he was legally allowed to leave, uh -huh. which was a really bad call considering the conditions, the visibility, uh, that there was a alternative. Um, oh, God, I'm, I'm losing my maritime vocabulary. I haven't been on a ship in so long. Uh, we had that there was a um, voyage plan and they had to deviate from that plan immediately due to changes in the harbor and everything. And the, the pilot had left. And it was it was far enough after the watch that the captain was also good in his room. And in that era, the captain is the paperwork guy. So it, 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 he was down in the room doing a huge ton of paperwork. Right. And right. Um, the accident was probably caused because the third mate was distracted by a female cadet and was flirting with her. And the other major cause of the accident was that Exxon Valdez was so abusive, or not abusive, they were such a crappy employer that they would employ you one, one rotation as a licensed personnel and the next as an AB, unlicensed. So just to, just to be like, kiss the hand that feeds you. And I sailed a lot of people who, who sailed with Exxon, and they're like, anybody competent who wasn't in an absolute senior position left. So you had a lot of junior officers who weren't very good because they weren't treated well, and you had the seniors just trying to run the show. Yeah. But Hazelwood was in his room. The mistakes that were made were frigging egregious, and it was in an era before, you know, alarms would ring in the captain's room. Now you have alarms ringing in the captain's room right away. Right. Um, but... The captain went up there and did exemplary damage control because he, he stayed on the reef. He kept a very slow ahead to minimize how much oil could escape. But he was made a scapegoat, and all he was was somebody who was letting his crew that they were trained to do do the job they were trained to do. And everybody slacked off or was incompetent in that chain of command up. The captain was just letting them do what they were supposed to do. And everybody in the industry knows he got a very raw deal. But mm -hmm. it was very easier to sell people yeah. to the idea that, oh, it's a drunk captain who did this rather than chronic corporate malfeasance and chronically underpaying personnel so you don't have any good personnel. And then the other real, you know, buried secret there is that no ship is owned from – there's always dummy shell corporations and so no ship anywhere in the world – has any any value above and beyond the value of the ship and the cargo it's carrying. The idea that Exxon owned the Valdez is crazy. They mm -hmm. had like a shell game where the Exxon Valdez was owned by some guy who lives in Louisiana or something. And his entire net worth is the Exxon Valdez and its cargo. So the idea that you could really hold the Exxon Valdez responsible for all that money 
is absurd. The Exxon paid that money because it was so serious that it would have brought attention to how the laws are rigged to protect the oil companies. So it never happened. They, they massively shelled out to avoid that. And mm -hmm. uh, Captain Hazelwood, I, I don't I don't think he saw jail time, but he lost, you know, he, I think he ended up teaching at Fort Schuyler. The guy responsible for the accident was, of course, the third mate. <laughs> and his name was Puppies, <laughs> and I don't think he ever sailed again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, and I, that's your that's that's the rank to which you've risen, right? Is third mate. That's and yeah, which is basically the entry level rank. If I've started in a you know Merchant Marine Academy, Mass Maritime, Marine Maritime. Um, if you start at an academy, you go to school for four years, and you can immediately take an exam to be a licensed officer. Those are the junior positions. Mm -hmm. If you don't go to an academy, you have to work on ship. You need three years sea time, day for day, on ships that are moving. Ships that are at anchor don't count and everything. And once you have that three years, you can then study and take all the courses on your own and do the same thing. And that's what I ended up doing. Oh, so you were also saying a lot of writers um, started uh, and beat poets started uh, on board ship. Very similar. Uh, to to what you did um yes it, um, can, yeah uh, can you can you say more about about who um i mean obviously it goes back to melville well, I, yeah there he is right in the bookshelf yeah yeah, well, yeah melville and unfortunately my big poet shelf is somewhere else but gary snyder would be the um the go-to there uh -huh. so gary snyder was working for the I, I ended up just reading a book on him so a little background he was working for the forestry department and doing the um, the the fire watches in the Pacific Cascades that became uh, fodder for Kerouac's um, Dharma bums. Mm. But he ended up being blacklisted for um, he had joined a he had joined a union of uh, Marine cooks and stewards and he was blacklisted for being a communist. So he lost his job with the parks department. And he was studying, to, he wanted to learn Japanese and go to Kyoto, so he signed on a tanker, and there's about an 80-page diary of his that appears in his um, volume, Earth House Hold, which is upstairs. And I always loved this and wanted to uh, emulate it in something. And a captain friend of mine is neighbors and best friends with Gary Snyder. So I went down there to interview him eventually, of all of them, there's also this book. I'm going to non sequitur. Uh, Woody, Woody Cisco and me. Woody Guthrie did two trips in the Merchant Marine. Each time he was torpedoed, his ship was torpedoed. And oh, wow. um, it's not played up well in the Klein biography, but there's this one. And uh, that's a fabulous book about sailing on license. But I, I mentioned this, so I got to interview Gary Snyder, and I was like, seems like all of you guys went to sea, and where did you ship? And I asked him, and he's like, there was a, there was a National Maritime Union, Union Hall on uh, 15th Street and, like, 7th Avenue. I believe it's still there, Jim. I don't know it, mm. but it's got, uh, it's got portholes for windows, and... Um, yeah. Everybody, everybody shipped out of that hall, including who's the guy, the guitarist from the sixties that did the mu movie about him. Uh, you know him, Jim. You met him. Well, uh, um, uh, Dave Van Ronk, or or yes, Dave, uh, Van, Dave yeah. Van Ronk. Yeah. So did, did Dave Van Ronk also sailed in that wow. that scene, the, the movie that was uh, based on him um, inside Llewellyn Davis? Yeah. Yeah. They have a scene where he goes to the union hall and they, they mistakenly call it the master mates and pilots union. That's not, I was in that union at that time. If that's a license union, he was trying to fill on license with the NMU out of 15th street and it didn't work. But I talked to Gary Snyder and I'm like, you guys all sailed. How'd you come up with that? And he looked at me like I was an idiot. He's like, it kept you out of the draft. Ah, uh, of course. So, uh, so of Ginsburg course. sailed, Kerouac sailed, they all sailed, and if you were on a ship, you were ineligible to go to Korea. Of course. <laughs> the little things we forget, and you know, here, here I was this like baby Gen Xer with diapers compared to Gary Snyder, and he's like, wait a minute, <laughs> this is the draft, dummy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd like to interject for a second, just to toss put my oar in the water here a little bit. 
and to uh, note my father, um, who was actually born Donald Michael Casson, but he insisted on calling himself Michael Donald Casson, was Merchant Marine during World uh-huh. War II. And he sailed on the convoys that went mm-hmm. back and forth across the North Atlantic. Mm-hmm. Um, I never talked to him much about it. He didn't really, you know, I don't think he didn't want to talk about it. I just don't think he really cared to talk about it. Um, my older brothers and sisters, I think, heard a lot more stories from him. But what I do remember talking to him about was he said, um, he said, yes, I had an illustrious career in the Merchant Marine. He said, I started at the very bottom. I was a greaser. That's the wiper now, yeah. Yeah, I was a greaser. That's what Gary Snyder was. <laughs> he said, after I did that for like a year, he said, I got promoted to a steamer. I'm like, what's a steamer? He says, they give you this big steam gun and you have to climb in the tubes, the boiler tubes in the engine and, and blow, blow them soot out. <laughs> and blow crap out of the boiler tube. So he says, that's, that's, that's like the, that's the illustrious scale of climbing the corporate ladder. In the mm. oh, well, Lee, yeah, and you're, you're bringing up an interesting point because the one thing that's beautiful about maritime is that the, the only way you cut a corner is to go to a maritime academy and come out either a third engineer or a third mate. But really, the positions are solidified. You can't jump positions. Right. And it's the same for everybody. You know, when you, Ahab, Captain Ahab did not start as captain. He started as a ship's boy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you, right. You know, right. And, yeah. and, and th- th- there's something beautiful about that because there is, you know, there's, there's nepotism and everything, but the nepotism, the, you still have to do it. We have, we have captains, you know, sons who sailed in the unlicensed union. They got out at the first opportunity, but they still got their sea time to get their license by going up and blowing the tubes. You know? Blowing the tubes. And he told yeah. me about how, uh, and the, I remember a bunch, I'll just only tell one, but he, I, you know, he said um, in those days, he said there was a hatch in the deck and they'd lower the cargo down on a crane and there was right. a big circular metal plate where the, the cargo would land. And then they would take the cargo and they'd move it someplace else in the hull. But there's one That's big secure, circular right. metal plate where all the cargo came down through a crane in the hold. And he said, of course, you know, when you have a whole bunch of guys, you got to keep them busy when there's absolutely nothing to do. He said, one of the things they made you do is take a piece of steel wool and scrub the plate down. And, and inside the hold, there's a tower inside the hold or maybe a high balcony. but there's a high spot where the guy sat who would direct where the stuff would go right next to the circular oh, yeah. plate. And my dad said, I was working on this. And he said, I fell asleep. I oh, fell yeah. asleep on the plate. He said, the guy in the tower took this gigantic monkey wrench and dropped, wasn't trying to hit him, but right, dropped yeah. it and hit on the plate. Yeah. My father said, I think I stopped vibrating about four months later. <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he said, I was just like this for like three months. Some of, but, some of the busy work out there is... is ungodlike you know. yeah that, so, but the closest it's, one i have we had a helicopter pad and that they have clover leaves where you know they, there's divots that look like little clovers and there's thousands of them i got sent up with an industrial vacuum to 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 vacuum each one you know <laughs> they, what, they, what is they, these, they, why are these so there's a pad there's a helicopter pad yeah, and there's it's not flat you... for whatever reason. Okay. Because the divots are there in case you have to secure helicopters to the deck in rough seas. Oh, so the helicopter is okay. there, you have to secure it, and they're all over the deck. So that's what you would secure it to the deck, and they're deep. They're, they're like three inches, and they're called clover leaves, and they have a cover on them. But, you know, of course it's the Navy. So, yeah, and I was not never in the Navy, but I was a Navy subcontractor, and there was a helo pad. And, you know, I got sent out in a dull day to vacuum, vacuum out each, walk around oh. thousands of them for like hey, $15 Captain, dollars an hour. Is this really a necessary exercise? For <laughs> Shut out. Out. None of it's necessary. You never ask that. You never ask. <laughs> well, David, um, what got you, what got you on, on board ship? What got you into the Merchant Marines? What was the motivation? <laughs> I was, draft. You know, I, I fell for the beat stuff. I, uh, I had read the Gary Snyder, a couple of others. I mean, I graduated the same year as you, Jim, and it was like yeah. 1987 in New York, and there was kind of a recession. And I was doing a lot of reading. I wanted to be a writer. That never panned out. But I remember reading Sid Hartha by Herman Hesse, and, you know, and having to go to this 
terrible. It was a very temp job of um, telemarketing, early telemarketing, mm. where, where a lot of artists, where a lot of artists worked, including yeah. a guy who claimed to be a lyricist for the Ramones. I mean, like, okay, wow, um, because his name was Kurt. Uh, but they took away my window. See, I was only there for like a month or two, but they took away my window and I was just like, you know what? I'm just like going to apply to get on a ship. And I talked to a guy in the, in my apartment building, the Pachulis. Do you remember the family? Uh, it Peaches sounds familiar. Pachulis. Yeah. But, uh, the father was an admiral and he said, if you really just want to get on a ship, show up at these places and it's going to be tough. This is real labor. This is not your class, you know? Right. And I did it. And, uh, but back then, you know, first ship, I made like 20 grand for four months, but hadn't spent any, it wasn't a lot of mm -hmm. money, but mm -hmm. it was a lot of money. And all of a sudden I had money and most of my friends didn't, I mean, right. most of them ended up with real careers and I ended up, you know, still just tooling along in the merchant Marine working as little as possible. Yeah. Um, $20,000 would be hoovered out of your pockets in New York city in about a week. So in, even in 1987, yeah. I mean, oh, if yeah. you were there, you were just like, Oh, you've got rent. You've got, you've got to go out with your friends. You've got to keep up with, you've got to keep up with people. You've got to, you know, you've got to try to pick up women who now have their choice of men in New York who are making a lot more than you. Yeah. There's a famous, yeah. Yeah. There's a famous scene in uh, Tom Wolf's bonfire, the vanities where um, the guys, the, the the guys visiting his friends, and the friends are uh, stiff him with the thing, and all he has is fifty dollars. And Tom Wolf right. takes like five pages to explain that fifty dollars in Manhattan is a wave of the hand. It's a bagatelle. <laughs> it's 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 just it's just the it's just the thinnest scintilla of thought. Um, it means nothing. It's just a gesture. <laughs> no, absolutely. I, I got to use a really nice edition of that book. But uh, <laughs> well, he evidently um, had to rewrite most of that book because he had the whole time planned. But the initial incident where he accidentally kills the guy took place in a subway. And then Bernard Getz happened. Oh, uh, Bernard Getz had, happened. Oh, uh, yes. Right. And he had to right. rewrite a vast swath of that to have it be a hit and run and under the Bronx Express. Right. Right, right, right. Well, David, um, we're we're gonna. I think we should bring it to a close. I, there's a ton more that I'd love to know about, um, and and maybe we can talk to you again sometime. But um, we should probably we should probably close it close it down here. And I really appreciate your yeah, it's great your sharing this with us. Um, yeah, stuff that most don't. people don't don't know, don't experience. Um, uh, hopefully they still can. I mean, in the Pacific Northwest is still a rite of passage to work on a ship. On the East Coast, I think I I, I didn't really meet people growing up who did it. Certainly not in our neighborhood where mm -hmm. we grew up. But in the West Coast, it's kind of a rite of passage to graduate high school and say you want to work at an Alaska fish processor. Right. And and once you once you do that, you kind of know where you can go if you want to stay in the industry. But that right. that's just not open to us. Well, that's true. My uncle has spent a lot of time on fishing vessels um, when he was younger. Um, that is true, but it is not something that I ever imagined for myself when I was when I was a kid. So um, it was uh, unusual and interesting that you chose that from New York. Um, cool. I'm still paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> We're all paying. Don't worry. That's why we all cluster here. There's nothing I can think of to say that would be clever to close on. But um, thank you, David. And thank you. Uh, you're welcome. We'll Thank you, you for having me. I, I really appreciate this. I love talking about maritime. So <laughs> we'll have you back. All right. All right. Cheers. See you. Nice, nice Thank meeting you. you, Lionel. Nice <laughs> meeting you. Bye. Funny Not Funny podcast is produced by Jim Infantino, music by Jim's Big Ego, this solo by Steve Sadler. You can find us at funnynotfunny.bigego.com. <laughs>